Welcome to the 1st of September meeting of the Mobile City Planning Commission. I would like to take a moment to review our general operating procedures. Our meeting is divided into two sessions, the public hearing session and the deliberation session. In the public hearing session, an applicant or a group applicant on the agenda is called. The applicant makes his or her presentation. Commission members ask questions, if any, and members of the public may make their comments. Only four people may speak for an agenda item and four people against an agenda item. And each speaker is limited to five minutes, subject to questions by the commission. After four minutes, you will hear a loud beep to indicate you have one minute left to speak. And at this point, please summarize your comments. After all opposition speakers have finished, an applicant will be given time to respond. If you do intend to speak, please come to the podium here at the bottom of the stairs, speak into the microphone, and give your name and address for our minutes. Please direct all your comments to the commission only and not to the applicant or the audience. And please remember to speak directly into the microphone. On routine applications, the applicant may simply raise his or her hand if there are no objections to the staff recommendations. I will then announce that the applicant is, is in full agreement with those recommendations. And if there are any questions, the applicant will be given an opportunity to respond. After hearing all the applications, the commission will go into the, to the deliberation session where we will discuss each application with input from the staff as necessary, but with no input from the audience. Commissioners then vote on each application and results of that voting can be learned from the planning department. If some issues arise in the deliberation session that were not addressed in the public hearing, we have the discretion to allow additional comments pertaining to those issues to resolve them or call for the application to be held over for discussion at a future meeting. Occasionally, one or more commission members may recuse themselves from discussing and voting on a given application. A recusal does not necessarily mean the member is directly involved with the application or the applicant. But depending upon the circumstances, ethical rules may require a recusal when there is only the slightest appearance of a conflict of interest. If a regular member recuses or is not present, the supernumerary will vote in their stead unless both are already voting due to absences. A reminder that the Planning Commission makes final decisions subject to appeal on subdivisions, planning approvals, and planned unit developments, or PUDs. And the Planning Commission only makes recommendations on zoning applications with the City Council making the final decision. At this time, please turn off all your cell phones or turn them to silent. Commissioners and staff, please remember to turn on your microphones when speaking. I'll call the roll. Myself, Jay Stubbs, present. Mr. Alan Cameron. Mr. Jennifer Denson. Mr. Carlos Gant. Ms. Shirley Sessions. Here. Mr. Taylor Atchison. Here. Mr. Matt Anderson. Mr. Nick Amberger. Here. Mr. Scott Jones. Ms. Susan Carley, Mr. Kirk Matei. With two members absent at the roll call, supernumeraries are in uh, position. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. On our agenda today, the first on all the agendas is holdovers. We have a holdover for the public hearing on the amendments to the downtown development district for the zoning ordinances at the Civic Center. I understand we have our mayor and he would like to speak. Mayor Stimson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sandy Stimson, 65 Oakland Avenue, Mobile 36608. You know, today before you has uh, an opportunity or an issue having to do with zoning. Uh, the city staff has presented a plan to you uh, to consider the zoning of the Civic Center site. I would remind you that since 2007, there have been multiple meetings, somewhat intermediate, not all associated with the same project that was at hand at the time. Um, so for a very long period of time, we have been looking at this site. I'd also remind you that the staff that's presenting this plan for the last six years have been neck deep and the UDC, which is involved the zoning of the entire city. So they're very sensitive to the, the uh, desires of the community. Uh, it's also a result of looking at the uh, adjacent zoning that abuts this property. It's from hearing from stakeholders about what their desires are. It's from development consultants who have made suggestions of what could be on this property but it's also from prospective developers over a long period of time. So as this zoning proposal has been presented, it's with all of that in mind 
Um, so it, I would say that it's been thought out. Perfect? Probably not. Uh, but it's a starting, that's not only a starting point, I think it's way down the road to being what ultimately could be built on that site. The reason for doing it, from one perspective, would be if I'm a developer and I look at the zoning as it exists today, I think there's a blank canvas there, and so I can go build anything. And we've seen that developers come in and say that I can do this, this, that, and the other. And really, by the time they have the public hearings and by the time they go through a zoning process, they realize they have wasted a lot of time and a lot of citizens' time, a lot of staff time listening to those uh, things because they think there's a blank canvas there. Okay. So by, if you take these suggestions uh, that are being presented to you, a developer can look at that and say, well, I could put a hotel here. I could put a seven-story building here. Here, I could put a six-story here. You know, these are the things that the community would like to see. As I think of myself as a developer, I would say, well, that doesn't quite fit over there uh, by Lafayette Street. You know, I see that they only want um, uh, three-story houses, you know, or possibly something like that. So I know I can't put a high-rise over that. So I'll quit wasting my time. The people, the citizens that maybe abut this property, they can sleep somewhat sound, more soundly at night, not uh, <coughs> thinking that somebody's going to come in with some bizarre plan to upset their neighborhood. So I think that going forward, it lays a, the parameters of what the playing field is of what this site could look like. Um, from a master planning uh, standpoint, I'll tell you this, the other day we were in Atlanta just looking at specifically the Civic Center site, things that could go there. The master planner said, well, you know, we had the zoning, which was fine, but somebody had to develop a master plan, and he said, I was getting ready to spend several hundred million dollars and I didn't want to take somebody else's master plan and put on, on my site because it's my money and this is what I would like to do based on those requirements. So I think that they have presented a zoning uh, framework uh, plan for that site, which is, should be acceptable to the city. Um, so that would be my remarks regarding that. Another thing that's been caught up in the conversation has to do with the Corps of Engineers building. In conversations with um, and listening to what uh, has been said in the public, said in private meetings, is it seems that the administration is trying to force this, uh, the building of the Corps of Engineers uh, upon the citizens and upon everybody that would be involved. Having had a conversation with the Colonel of the Corps, uh, he agrees that we ought to slow this process down so that it can be better explained, you know, the pros and cons to make sure we get this right. So I'd hope that your focus would be on zoning today and not let's get caught up in what uh, a future developer may do, uh, you know, with some of the conversations that's going on. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Stimson. Before we open it up to public hearing from the audience, is there any comments from staff? I would just point like Mr. Point out. Chairman, I'm sorry. I, I was I didn't know the mayor was going to head out. I, I just want to say thanks for your comments, um, and, and I appreciate you listening, and then acting after you've listened. I think that means a lot to the the citizens of the city, and, and me personally as as an elected official for District Six. I want to say thank you uh, for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Burt. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point out that you have comments that we received uh, from the public since the August 18th meeting. Uh, there's from seven people, uh, Barbara Cadell, William Guest, Jeffrey Morrow, Jim Box, Government Street Collaborative, Marie Dyson, and uh, Brenda Bolton. Thank you and duly noted. This time we'll open it up to public hearing comments on the Civic Center as this is a holdover item. We have a sign-in sheet. I will go down that sign-in sheet and call your name. If you'd like to speak, a reminder, come down to the end of the stairs and speak into the podium. Give your name and your address for our minutes. A reminder, you also have a five-minute window of speaking. You'll hear a minute, or excuse me, you'll hear a beep at the end of the fourth minute. You'll have one minute to summarize your comments. First on the list, Mr. Stephen Welford.
Hello again. Thank you for listening to me. Um, Stephen Welford, 1464 Pittman Drive, Mobile. Um, I want Mobile to have a vibrant and prosperous downtown. And to do so, one must zone according to the principles of new urbanism. Uh, what Populous has proposed is transplanting suburbanism to the heart of the city, uh, which is mainly one structure with one use per tract. Mobile is a city. Let's build an urban environment uh, for this zoning uh, this entire district should be mixed use, dense, and vertical to pack as many uses as possible on the available land. Um, when considering the zoning in this district, the following questions must be answered in the affirmative. Does it entice traffic to exit off of I-10? Does it create synergy to ensure the success of the arena and, and Dauphin Street businesses? Does it generate revenue and maximize the use of the land? And does it create a pedestrian-friendly environment, i.e., does it put feet on the street? The Civic Center District is Mobile's front door. It must be zoned and developed to have maximum street appeal from I-10. The millions of out-of-state vehicles that pass through an I-10 will judge whether Mobile is worth the stop based on what they see primarily on CC4 and to a lesser degree on CC3 and 2. This is the only part of downtown visible to westbound traffic leaving the tunnel. Downtown Mobile will only have one access point from I-10 once the Water Street ramp is torn down, which is the Canal Street exit. We have to pack this district full of the maximum number of attractions to get drivers to make an impulse decision to exit and we have to offer travelers as many reasons to visit downtown as possible. Everyone was excited by the Mobile Live proposal by Cordish in 2019 because it was a vibrant, pedestrian-friendly, revenue-generating concept, but it had two gargantuan flaws. It limited the Civic Center Arena, and thus any hope of having sports events or concerts, and it cannibalized the business of existing food and drink establishments on Dolphin Street. What we have to do is use this land to create synergy to ensure the success of the Civic Center Arena and the theater. Uh, to attract sporting events and concerts. I would like to suggest to the Commission that Mobile is probably the largest city in America without a civic professional sports team, and we're also the largest city in America without regular music concerts. And we need to, to rectify the situation with the zoning. So one, we need to keep the theater and the arena, and then actively pursue concerts and indoor sports, basketball, arena football, whatever. Uh, two, we have to zone for a large hotel with enough rooms to attract events. Why has the Birmingham Jefferson Civic Center succeeded whereas Mobile has failed? Uh, in part because they have a sufficient number of hotel rooms adjacent, which enables them to attract more events. Uh, the Birmingham Sheraton Hotel has 16 stories and 739 rooms. By comparison, the Riverview has 28 stories, but only 373 rooms. Uh, the smaller the footprint of the hotel, the taller the hotel must be to achieve the economies of scale that will allow a developer to make a profit and to attract a signature hotel. The smaller footprint set back from the sidewalk allows for retail fronting Claiborne Street, which I envision as a pedestrian corridor to Water Street South. Um, and you can have a terraced appearance, you know, terrace it back, but there should not be any overall height restrictions on CC4, CC3, or CC2. Uh, why? Again, uh, developers have to have economies of scale. Uh, height limits are an artificial limitation that will set up the entire district to fail. Uh, for example, uh, building a 30-story tower is cheaper per floor or hotel unit than building a 15-story tower. So um, I do see that there is a cause for uh, Lawrence Street, what the area boarding Lawrence Street, to have some sort of height limit just because it's so narrow. But Canal Street is very wide, and it has a tree-lined median separating it from the residential area to the south. Um, you know, with respect to the... You know, I, I do sympathize with the Church Street East District residents who uh, say they don't have enough parking. Uh, you can resolve that issue by cutting diagonal parking into the east side of St. Lawrence Street, uh, South Lawrence Street, rather, um, and zone it specifically for Church Street East residents, and then set the sidewalk back a little bit, and that eliminates the parking need for them. But as far as overall uh, height limits, um, okay, one, one minute? One minute. Okay, so you have to zone for sufficient parking. Uh, this uh, parking deck that they propose is only 1,000 spaces, which doesn't even make up their initial 1250. Uh, the parking garage needs to be three times as large to encompass needs for other uses for the district if you're going to compartmentalize all of your parking in the one facility. Uh, but it needs to be set back from the sidewalks, uh, built vertically to increase capacity of minimum ground footprint, and uh, wrap it on all sides with other uses. And uh, the only, again, only the entrances and exits to the parking garage should be visible from the sidewalk. Uh, you want to create a pedestrian uh, friendly environment. Uh, all sidewalk frontage along Claiborne and Canal to where CC4 lanes should be zoned for pedestrian friendly use. I envision a multi-story terraced outdoor lifestyle center shopping experience. 
Uh, pedestrians are attracted to a streetscape that engages them and wants to walk in front of a parking garage or blank walls or empty expanses of grass or the blank windows of an office building is used as irrelevant to everyone but those who work there. Uh, and green floor retail built to the sidewalk and obscuring the parking garage from view. And uh, in order not to cannibalize Dolphin Street, you can zone it for entertainment uses along with themes of sports and entertainment uh, rather than uh, restaurants and bars. Uh, you could have an indoor uh, bowling and arcade uh, complex like Daily Busters or virtual reality sports complex, indoor mini golf, an ice skating rink. You could even mount a Ferris wheel on top of, of the parking garage and, and, or an observation deck. It's been done in Japan. Um, Mr. Welford, we're at, we're at time. And we appreciate all of your comments. Thank you, Mr. Welford. At this time, I'll call Michael and Marguerite Guin. Understood. Ms. Sue Winter. Thank you. Ms. Marie Dyson. And before Ms. Dyson starts, just to let you know that the comments that she submitted in her page references, the numbering is actually off. So if you need clarification on that, I can provide you the actual numbers. Sorry about that. I'm Marie Dyson. I live at 203 South Dearborn Street. Um, and I'm sorry about being off on the numbers. I was using the line version of what um, Bert had sent to me, and I, I think I just probably misread it. You have comments from me again, and I'm up here again, and you have, again, comments from Jeff Morrow from our neighborhood, and Jim Back has submitted his comments before he left. So you have all of that. We tried to consolidate all of our comments to stress some certain points that we want to make in terms of consideration. All of Most of our points deal with SDCC5, which is along Lawrence Street, which is the res across from the residential part of Church Street East. So instead of trying to go through lines that I got wrong, we'll just talk about my first point is on the use table. It was table two use table for residential. Uh, change multifamily from R to not allowed. Uh, only single family dwellings should be allowed, which is consistent with what's across the street in Church Street East Residential. On the next one, it was, I won't even say what page it was, but it was referencing residential parking. Change from one space allowed to two spaces allowed per unit on site, which is what we have across the street in Church Street East Residential. Um, the next one is regarding finishes, roofing, fences, materials, et cetera. And I know that this is not within the purview of the, the zoning commission or the planning commission, but I want to stress, and I put in here making it mandatory that all projects within local historic districts require review and approval by the architectural review board, which may limit the size, the design, and the material choice. I don't know who, who is the deciding factor there, but I, I say that because I believe that the ARB needs solid support. Um, and again, addressing the parking. We have parking available in Church Street East. We're OK, so, uh, west of Lawrence. What we're addressing is what we have addressed in all of our comments, the parking right now designed for the Civic Center site is insufficient. It is insufficient to accommodate event, commercial, business, and residential parking. So a plan for additional parking should be submitted, we believe, and it will curb people coming across Lawrence Street and parking in front of our houses. We want to avoid that. We believe a master plan, plan for the site should be completed before revising the zoning. And the other thing that was brought up or has come up, and Jeff Morrow, our neighbor who lives on Lawrence Street, has questioned this and put it in his comments as well. As required by law, a plan for removing the numerous heritage oaks that are currently within the parking lot of the Civic Center. Should be, a plan should be submitted for review and approval by the City of Mobile Arborist 
and the Mobile Tree Commission. The point of that comment is to draw attention to the fact that I could not find anything in the amendment that dealt with what are we going to do with those oaks. Um, and I think we're required to do something about that. So those are my comments. And I'm sorry I got the pages wrong, but the topic is the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tyson. Next on the list, Ms. Wanda Cochran. Good afternoon. Wanda Cochran, 465 Dauphin Street, Mobile. Um, thanks for doing this, for listening and caring about downtown. Um, I am a lawyer, unfortunately, no. um, and I've lived and worked downtown for a very long time. I raised a family here. I moved my mother here. So I guess our family's kind of been all in for downtown. Uh, it's really nice to live downtown because people in Mobile love their city. And so it makes it a very exciting place to live. I am not a planner, however. I do like to hang out with planners, but I am not a planner. So when I was thinking today, you know, what, what can I bring to this discussion that might add something? I have to say, I always read the law. And so as much as I would like to talk about viewing stands and parking and siting of buildings and materials, I really need to talk to you about the law because that's very important to me. So I guess the short thing is, I'm both professionally and personally interested in the downtown development code in particular. So you probably know this, but the DDD code is separate and apart from all of the other city zoning regulations. It's actually a separate appendix in the DDD code. And that separation was intentional because the DDD code is called a form-based code. And it is not like the city's regular code. Section 2 of the DDD code says that it is to be the sole zoning code for downtown Mobile. And the rules that are in the DDD take precedence over any other regulation, including the dimensional requirements of the subdivision regulations. Yes, there are a couple of exceptions, stormwater, but you get the picture. It's a separate code with special rules. So in deciding what to do downtown, your first resource is what does the code say? A formed base code sounds fancy but what it really means is that when you are writing the code, you are deciding about what the form of the building is, not its appearance, not is it pretty, not is it ugly, what are the materials. How should that building particularly fit within its surroundings with a particular emphasis on how it interacts with the public realm? And the goals for downtown Mobile, of course, are to create a more exciting pedestrian environment. And so the form-based code that we have isn't something pulled off the shelf. It was a customized document, especially for downtown. And I don't know if any of y'all were here when, when the planners were here doing this. They had tape measures out, and they actually m measured the lengths of the blocks downtown. I mean, the, it, it was very detailed. So um, the result of that planning process, which preceded the adoption of the 2014 DDD code, the result of that was there were six zoning forms that were picked for downtown. They weren't picked. They were drafted specifically for downtown. 
One minute. T, T3, T4, T5, 1, T5, 2, and T6. And the regulating plan that you have in your packet shows where the are, you, these are located. If you look at that regulating plan, you will see that there are three exceptions. The Civic Center property is one exception. And the reason it was an exception is that a decision was made at the time the code was developed to postpone planning that site, assigning key zones to it until there was a master plan to guide that process. When I look at what has been presented to you, what pops into my mind is, oh my God, this is a planned unit development, a PUD. PUDs are fine in the regular zoning code. In fact, the DDD's got a PUD process in it. But PUDs are not appropriate in the downtown code. And in fact, PUDs are specifically prohibited by the code downtown. So here's my point. You are the planning commission. And what you are being asked to do is to weigh in on zoning amendments without the benefit of a plan. And how do we know there's no plan? Because you've never adopted one, and neither has the city council. Our city code requires a master plan for this special district. And I would urge you to tell the city council that you cannot make these decisions until a planner has been hired who knows form-based codes and who can make the proper recommendations. Thank you. Sorry I took so long. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next on the list, Ms. Donna Camp. No, ma'am. Ms. Carol Hunter. But thank you for trying. I mean, it doesn't work like a congressional hearing where you can see time. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Hunter with the Downtown Mobile Alliance, 261 Dolphin Street. The 20-plus acre Civic Center property is one of the most important development sites in downtown Mobile, if not the entire city. City leadership should be commended for seeking solutions to the aging buildings that have served our citizens since the 1960s. The options for renovation of the complex are creating a great deal of excitement among many Mobilians. However, the rezoning of this important site is being rushed. It was only two weeks ago that the plan creating entirely new zoning categories was publicly discussed. The form-based downtown development code this body adopted in 2014 set aside the Civic Center site as a special district that requires a master plan before zoning could be applied. Now, it's been argued that the Populous Plan is a master plan. But while Populous is a world-class architecture firm with vast experience in entertainment and sports venues, it does not appear to have any particular expertise in form-based coding. That is what is needed to maximize the development opportunities on this uniquely urban site. This is, in fact, an opportunity for us to knit back the fabric of downtown to create the kind of walkable urban place that is so much in demand by the people who live, work, and visit here. For the most part, these new zoning categories, or transects, are contrary to this kind of pedestrian-centered development. They allow wide setbacks, multiple curb cuts, and virtually no restrictions on the type of building material used. If indeed we want the kind of charming urban village that exists in other historic cities that we envy, this is not the code that gets us there. And why do we even need new transects? Since the DDD code was adopted, we have seen $100 million worth of investment downtown. This seems to be proof that the code is not restrictive, nor does it discourage pedestrian center development. Investors have been more than willing to use the existing form-based requirements. We should not allow a code that requires less of developers than the current DDD code, nor apparently do we have to. 
This sense of urgency seems only to exist because downtown stakeholders have been kept in the dark as to the need for any rezoning. Believe me, I understand the importance of confidentiality with, with, when projects are being negotiated. However, the city could simply have announced the strategic benefit of developing a master plan as soon as this site was under consideration for the core building. The master planning process could have been moving forward all this time. New federal buildings don't have to be anti-urban, even with the required setbacks, but they must be thoughtfully situated and planned. Given the importance of the Civic Center site and the impact any future development will have on the rest of downtown, I respectfully request that the DDD amendments be tabled until a master plan by a firm with expertise in form-based coding is created. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. That concludes the ones that have signed in. I'll this time open up for anyone that did not sign up to speak on the Civic Center item on the agenda. Seeing none, uh, any questions or comments from commissioners to staff on this item? And then I'll have one confirmation for staff. We'll treat this as any other agenda item and we'll go in this order in the deliberation session. All right. Moving on on the agenda to the other holdover. Number one, multiple addresses at Cottage Hill Road and 2113 Demopo Demetropolis Road and 2104 Garmin's Lane. We have a subdivision, a PUD, and a rezone. It's been recommended for tentative approval on the subdivision, the PUD, and the rezone. Is the applicant present? Are you in agreement with the subdivision 15 conditions? The findings of fact in the PUD, as well as its conditions, of which there are 17, and then the reasons, reasoning, and conditions. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here to speak for agenda item number one? Is there one here to speak against agenda item one? Seeing none, we'll move on. Number two. New sidewalk waiver application, 4291 Halls Mill Road. This sidewalk waiver has been recommended for approval along Riviera Duchesne Road and McKinnon Industrial Parkway. Is the applicant present? Are you in agreement? Is anyone else here to speak for this sidewalk waiver application? Anyone here to speak against this sidewalk waiver application? Seeing none, we'll move on. Under group applications, number three on the agenda, 3725 Airport Boulevard and 817 Downtowner Boulevard, Excel Academy. We have a planning approval. It's been recommended for approval with findings of fact, of which there are three and 10 listed conditions. A PUD recommended for approval with three findings of fact and nine conditions. Is the applicant present? Are you in agreement? Is anyone else here to speak for this agenda item? 3725 Airport Boulevard, 817 Downtowner. Anyone here to speak against this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll move on to number four on the agenda, 3516 and 3526 Halls Mill Road, the CREAX subdivision, recommended for tentative approval with eight listed conditions. Also a PUD, recommended for approval with four findings of fact and 10 conditions and a rezone Recommended for approval. Is the applicant present? Are you in agreement with all the conditions and listings and findings of fact for each of the three? Is there anyone else here to speak for this ap this agenda item? Halls Mill Road. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Representative from Moss come by the office this morning and state that there was an easement on here. I don't know if he's present at the meeting or not. Could you repeat that one more time in the microphone? Oh, it looks like he's up here. Okay. Yeah, I'll let him. Thank he, you. He can best speak to it. Reminder to state your name and address for a minute. Russell Lomax with Mobile Air Warner Tours, 4725 Moffitt Road. Um, I think we're kind of working it out with the, uh, with the uh, surveyor, but we have an easement that goes across the lot 
that serves the adjacent lot. It's in the back, uh, like 27 feet away from the, uh, from the, I guess it's going to be the southwest corner of the lot and goes across. Uh, it's not running the back of the lot, though. It's just a 10 foot easement to run straight across, and there's a manhole sitting back in the back of the, uh, uh, of the lot there that services the adjacent lot. It also services this lot. Mr. I, I, I sent the uh, I sent a copy of the uh, well I gave him the actual meets and or not meets and bounds but the uh, real property book and the page number and I think he's going to be getting those on the plat prior to recording. All right, thank you, sir. Comments? Uh, yes, sir. Like I said, this was brought to staff's attention this morning. If there is in fact an easement, it does need to be reflected on the final plat with a notation that no structures or improvements can be placed in the easement without the permission of the easement holder. With the applicant being present, do you have any comments or questions regarding that easement? Is there anyone else here to speak for agenda item four, three act subdivision? Anyone here to speak against this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll move on. Number five, 1705 Dolphin Island Parkway, Fulton Track Subdivision. Been recommended for tentative approval with nine listed conditions. Also a subdivision sidewalk waiver been recommended for denial. And then a planning approval that has been recommended for approval. Findings of fact listed three and 17 conditions. Is the applicant present? Are you in agreement with each of those subdivision, sidewalk waiver denial, and then the planning approval? Please come on down. Good afternoon, Evan Gertz with Duplantis Design Group, uh, 3703 Old Shell Road. Um, uh, Malls also brought to our attention and to staff's attention uh, this morning some is potential issues with easements on the property. Um, so the first one, I, th I think that Russell and I have agreement on. Uh, we're just going to confirm that, make sure that the easement is shown correctly on the plat. The final plat will be revised to reflect that um, if any changes need to be made. Um, the second one is that Maws uh, has indicated that there is a line on the property encumbering the property that has no easement over it. Um, and our, our client has uh, agreed to discuss with them how we might do that. But I would like to bring it to staff's and the commission's attention that that line is further inside the property, which is going to potentially prevent some of our ability to comply with some of the landscape, the perimeter landscaping requirements, um, just based on the redevelopment proposed here. Um, and so we just, I, I think what, what we would ask is that the commission please uh, perhaps allow staff uh, the opportunity and the permission to work with us on the landscaping, just to make sure that that's clear that we're not going to be able to install trees on top of two malls, two or four domains, one of which is outside of an easement. So that's, that's really all we have. And then we're here for any questions that you might have for us. Any comments or questions from commissioners? Any comments from staff? Two things. One, just the standard condition yet again regarding the easements. And while easements are shown here, I believe part of the issue is there's even more easement than what is shown. Uh, but the standard condition regarding the permission of the easement holder will take care of that. In regards to uh, tree plantings, we would just recommend that that be coordinated with urban forester, uh, with the urban forestry and staff. Question, so that where we have the easement extending, which easement are we talking about and which way does it extend? Does it extend south towards the parking lot or does it extend further um, towards the, the buffer, I guess? If, if it's at top easement, does it extend further? I yes, along the north property line, okay. you see the easement. I yep. believe it goes all the way to the east. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, a question for the Mars representative. Is is that the large uh, transmission sewer main? Okay, thank you. 
I, and I, well, and I suspect you wouldn't want any any vegetation on top of that easement at all. Thank you. Any further questions, comments from commissioners? Yeah, the <clears throat> reference is a twenty-five foot setback from DIP. Is that right? Is this a service road? Should that be Neshota? Or is it, it, is it DIP? It kind of gets lost in the DIP right of way, but it is a 25 foot setback from the frontage. Um, so we can just say from the front property line in order to eliminate any ambiguity. Anyone else here to speak for this agenda item? Anyone here to speak against this agenda item? All right, we'll move to the final agenda item in the public hearing agenda. 6712 Old Dobbin Drive North, preserved at Milkhouse Creek Subdivision, recommended for tentative approval with 10 listed conditions. A rezone recommended for approval with reasoning and two listed conditions. Is the applicant present? Are you in agreement? Is there anyone else here to speak for agenda item six? Mr. Chairman, if I may draw attention to the commission, you have comments at your seats. Yes, thank you. For agenda item? Is there anyone else here to speak against agenda item six? All right. Yes, sir. I'm Trey Brooks, 6820 Coventry Court, Mobile 36695. Um, I live one cul-de-sac away from phase three off of Valleydale. Uh, Milk House Creek actually cuts my um, little over an acre in half. And my only, I've, I even asked about it at the, Tillman, when they come out to Tillman's Corner and done the community meeting, is the storm water runoff. Uh, I applied in 2019 for a, uh, a landing pad for a classic car, and it was denied for storm water runoff for going into Milk House Creek. Um, so I'm just curious about how we're doing 122 houses, and I couldn't get an 8 by 12. Um, 2016, when I bought the property, Milk House Creek only crested out of its banks, which are about three foot. It's three foot down, got three foot banks that come through there. It crested and come out and got two foot deep two or three times a year. Since the city went in and cleaned up Milk House Creek, north and south of Cottage Hill Road, making its way to Providence, it floods once a month, and I'm talking this deep in the backyard. Uh, so if we're going to put 122 homes, where is that water going to go? How much more of my property am I going to lose because of it? I spoke with Tony E. Bright with the city engineering. He come to my house three times because I have a, a culvert literally in my front yard in a cul-de-sac, catches water and shoots it off under my property into Milk House Creek. And every year I was adding uh, three yards of dirt to it. And finally someone said, that's a, that's a city deal. They use that for runoff. They need to take care of it. He come out told me they were going to give me some rocks to put down there to help with the erosion. So I've lost about five foot off of, of actual property where the creek comes in and makes a hard 90. Uh, every time I've called back about it ever since then, it's been COVID, 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 COVID. I even got a piece of paper on the fridge where I, me and him both signed, giving him permission to come on my property to make these repairs. Nothing's ever came of it. Um, Urban forestry come out because there's two trees in that 90 degree bend that were standing straight up. Like I said, I've lost five foot of property right there. They are now sitting at about 30 degrees, about to fall in the creek. They told me when they fall in the creek, they'll take care of it. Uh, so my question is, with these all this concrete we're putting up, what's going to happen to that water? Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Feel free to stand there with. Um, 
the developer or the applicant like to comment on the questions? Yeah, I'd like for them to, to respond to that. I, I know we had a couple of meetings in, in the district, but it, I don't believe that you were there. If, if you could come and, and address well, the hold on just a minute, because I do recall that we had one more okay. uh, speaker from the pub, from the audience. We'll okay. give him an opportunity to speak as well, and then the applicant can respond. Great. Thank you. Before this gentleman speaks, is there anyone else here to speak against this agenda item? Okay. Hi, Richard Widows, 6704 Old Dobbin Drive. My concern with this preserve is regarding the traffic situation at the north end of the, uh, the, the plat there. My house abuts the, it's, I'm at the western end of Old Dobbin Drive North, and uh, they're wanting, uh, originally, the, when, it, when Benchmark planned this uh, back in 2020 when we were going through uh, they're having uh, like a little neighborhood meetings and all that that they they put together. Uh, they were not even concerned with uh, attaching that particular uh, street over to Old Dobbin Drive North. Uh, I believe their initial uh, connection for the street was going to be through the Blue Ridge uh, uh, the Parkway right there, then come down, and then the other entrance was going to be down at Annabellum and Harness Way. You came down for, through the first section there. Uh, at that time, I think this lost some momentum over the last two years with COVID that the, the uh, residents of Asheville, which is on the northwest portion of that flat right there, had great concern that if Old Dobbin Drive North was connected there, that it would become a freeway through there for people coming, to, coming in down that street and coming straight on down Old Dobbin Drive to as a huge cut through. And uh, with uh, the, the, we, uh, they were thinking that by not connecting Old Dobbin Drive North, but just using the uh, Blue Ridge Boulevard and down to the Harness Way antebellum connection there, that, that would be enough to handle the initial uh, phase one of that uh, property uh, being developed there. And I have I have great concern about connecting that. On the east, on the east end of at where uh, where my house sits, right there. Any questions from commissioners? Thank you, Mr. Widows. Thank you. I'm James Shore. I live at uh, 6770 Deanna uh, Deanna Court. 36695. Uh, I am a resident of the Asheville uh, subdivision. Um, and again, my concerns uh, similarly uh, have to do with traffic safety. Um, I have serious concerns about the potential traffic uh, issues uh, that this development would cause for our neighborhood in particular. Uh, as was mentioned, it, it certainly can, has the potential to become a raceway uh, coming out of this uh, subdivision uh, and into ours. Mm -hmm. uh, we've lived in Asheville for over 20 years now. Uh, it's a real small subdivision. There's only about 25 houses uh, with relatively little traffic. The proposed uh, street connector from the planned subdivision through the Asheville subdivision is uh, our main con uh, objection. Specifically, there would be the potential for, uh, for a significant increase in traffic on the Blue Ridge Boulevard and the connection to Cottage Hill Road from several hundred existing houses in Carriage Hills and the other adjoining subdivisions, as well as the hundred plus houses uh, in this proposed uh, subdivision. The potential increase in traffic uh, is alone troublesome, but that combined with this additional traffic spilling onto Cottage Hill Road only multiplies the concern. The intersection at Blue Ridge Boulevard and Cottage Hill Road is difficult to manage now, especially at peak traffic periods. As a matter of fact, uh, in the mornings uh, between probably 7 and 8 o'clock, we can hardly ever get out of our subdivision uh, onto Cottage Hill Road. The potential added traffic from this new subdivision as well as the other traffic cutting through uh, from the adjoining subdivisions would only exacerbate traffic problems uh, at this intersection. Uh, I walk for recreation and health 
uh, through the Carriage Hill subdivision and the adjoining ones. And I can tell you, there are people cutting through to get to Cottage Hill Road and to Hillcrest Road from all those other subdivisions. So now you're talking about flooding even more of that traffic through our subdivision and on the Cottage Hill Road. So in an effort to uh, ease the traffic flow through the, Cottage Hill, or through the Asheville subdivision, I would implore you to look carefully for the ways to mitigate uh, these uh, safety concerns. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. I believe you said Mr. Shorter. Thank you, sir. Reminder, we limit speakers for or against agenda items to the count of four, and we have one more slot remaining. Seeing none, we'll allow the applicant to address the concerns brought up. Good afternoon, Trey Genright, J Consulting, 208 Green Hill Road, North Fairhope, Alabama. I represent the applicant. Um, I want to thank you for your time this afternoon to discuss this project. This is a project that we started back in the early phases of 2020, but prior to COVID. Um, it was originally scheduled for your April 2020 Planning Commission meeting, with, uh, but due to COVID, it was pushed back to the June Planning Commission meeting. These very same items were uh, voted on and approved at the June 5th Planning Commission meeting in 2020. Um, since 2020, it went to, since those meetings, it went to the council in October, uh, where we tabled it to have two years worth of conversations on traffic. Um, there was complications with having town hall meetings um, with the COVID comp situation. Um, Councilman Jones was elected. We wanted to give him time to get into office to be familiar with, with our project. And so we've had meetings with him. He's, he was graciously enough to, to have a town hall meeting back in July or June 30th that we had to, to talk about these items in here. We've had subsequent traffic studies looking at this. Those studies have been reviewed by city traffic engineers. Um, and we all feel that what has presented is the best solution for the, for the matter. Um, this property, for, for various reasons unknown to me, um, was zoned years ago as R2, R1, and commercial. So what we're doing is wanting to rezone all this from commercial to family dwellings to just simply single family residents. Only what we want to do is single family residents. <laughs> By right, the developer has the, has the ability to go in there and do a combination of single family and sing, uh, two, two family dwellings in there. We don't want to do that. We want to downzone this to R1 so that we can just be, build single family dwellings. That has been the, the plan since you guys have approved it with, um, back in June of 2020. Uh, that plan is still stationary today. Um, the, the preliminary plat section of the approvals is for phase one. That section is what has been reviewed with the drainage. Those things have been, um, was reviewed back in 2020 with some minor conditions. We've had it tabled since then and our staff to address those comments. But as soon as uh, pending this approval, we will move forward and get those, uh, those cleaned up. Um, but the state drainage conditions, they will be designed in accordance with city standards, minimum standards. Um, so. Future phases, such as phases as in phase three that was discussed, will also meet those standards that are in requirement as a city at that time. Um, so again, uh, we feel like this is a, um, a case where we're, we're down zoning property, taking it from two family predominantly down to single family, um, and that the traffic situation has been vetted through city staff, and we graciously appreciate their effort for the past two years. So um, thank you guys for your time, and if you have any questions, I'm glad to address them. Could you address the um, the drainage in, in the wetland issue that's been brought up? Is, yes, sir. So um, Milk House Creek is a, is, a, is a protected area. We've had wetland delineations on there. Um, phase one stormwater management system has been designed and it meets city standards. Um, future phases as they come before the city will be reviewed by city engineering. Um, and before we can get any permits, they'll have to be blessed and, and, and granted Therefore, so we are, our intent is to fully meet city standards when we make those subsequent applications. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, Mr. Genright, I guess uh, this is kind of an observation to share with my fellow commissioners, but all of your lots appear to have carved off and the ones.
100 year and the 500 year flood that's so correct yes sir. lots are not so unlike the other gentleman that spoke where uh kind of in yesteryear when subdivisions took place sometimes all that excess land that might have been a wetland or a floodplain are actually part of the lots uh what y'all have done here you know is is probably more than preferred modern way to do it in that anything that was wetland or floodplain you've actually carved that off and basically protected it by way of a by way of it being a common area instead of a instead of a lot that's going to have a house built on it. correct sorry i didn't make that clarification and thank you for pointing that out so the exhibit up there reflects what the, the wetland areas are those areas and you can see how the development section works in and out as fingers in there all improvements will be outside of any wetlands or floodplain zone so they're all in 100% up in the area. There'll be no improvements within the well. One of the other discussions that we had, and I think we had three community meetings on this, um, as part of this development going in, they are gonna have to upgrade the current drainage infrastructure that is, is there. Um, and that will help counter the removal of the trees that are there, et cetera, um, to ensure that the flooding issues that is a concern um, is not, and you may want to just address that a little bit to, to ease some of the concerns there as well. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have my glasses in front of me. I, mean, I got them on, but I can't even read this fine print. Um, but one of the streets coming out of Carriage Hills um, has a main outfall of storm drainage that drains through this property into Milkhouse Creek, and that drainage system is in failure. Um, the inlets have collapsed in, and the pipes are um, Simply stated, they're in failure. So what our project will be doing is to, is to replace that infrastructure, put in new and modern materials, and then also collect uh, some swales in there that'll help um, alleviate any of that uh, continued erosion in that area. So um, we're fixing a problem that's been there. It's been work going on for probably 20, 30 years now. Any further comments or questions from commissioners? All right, thank you, Mr. General. Thank you. We will now close the public hearing session and move into deliberation. Move back to the first item on the agenda, holdover of the public hearing, the Downtown Development District, Civic Center Special District, We'll open the microphones for any questions or comments from commissioners to staff or staff to commissioners. <clears throat> A question for staff. I guess can we start by the, um, the master plan that was submitted to us. Can we walk through that a little bit? Um, I noticed the core building is not on the piece of paper that we're calling the master plan. Can we kind of talk through why that is and, and what exactly we're looking at? Because there also aren't any new buildings proposed on CC2. Um, I'll speak to the removal of the core building from the site. I think it's reflective of the mayor's comments. Um, it is his desire for this uh, site to be evaluated on its own merits. Um, and any considerations or comments that you have for, for that particular area shouldn't move forward irrespective of that development at this time. So um, the standards that were presented previously to you still are in place. And so if you um, feel that those need to be modified um, in any way, it's uh, the commission's desire to, we're, we're listening to see how you'd like any modifications or changes to be made there or any other uh, area of the site. Mr. Chairman, do we have any, um, if, I'm sure that y'all had to think a whole lot about what we could possibly drum up. Um, have y'all had a chance to put anything together that would maybe reflect some of the changes like Marie Dyson has, you know, a few things listed with regard to what we see as CC5 here. Do y'all have anything that we could maybe work off of to try and build a skeleton for what this should really look like? Staff has not prepared any specific recommendations. Um, you know, our hope is to 
uh, for the commission to reflect on what they've heard previously during the public hearing um, process. Um, the, at the business meeting, we hope to get a little bit more guidance there, um, but uh, we, we, we have not uh, taken the, those comments and, and structured anything that we're presenting back to you all. This document, has this been made publicly available? I think we got it yesterday. Just, and that's based off some of the comments that infer that there was not a master plan. Our intention with the with what you got in front of you is just to reflect how the um, zoning districts, um, as proposed for the Civic Center site, uh, overlay with the plan that Populous presented. Um, and as was presented in previous meetings, we believe that there is a correlation between what populace prepared and what how these zoning districts were uh, laid out. And so our intent was for you to see how those things compare. Shayla, this, this though is basically, this is the same drawing that we saw in the handout last week. So the public, that was available to the public, correct? Uh, Mr. Hamburger, the zoning boundaries that are shown on the large sheet are the same, yes. I just want to make sure that everybody's clear though we're we are not approving a master plan today we're just talking about the zoning of these separate districts and, and i think that's an important point that needs to be made um, the master plan will come later we're just setting up the dynamics of what can happen in this space based off of the zoning that is being pushed forward and, and i think First of all, I'd, I'd like to say thanks to my colleagues last week. The discussion with the staff was on point and, and spot on, and, and I know it helped me out. I, I heard a lot of positive comments from that. Um, the feedback from the mayor is indicative that, you know, everybody is listening, everybody is attuned to all of these issues. Um, this is not easy stuff. We've been talking about this for years. And, you know, it's made my head hurt. I'm not a planner. I'm not a developer. I'm not an engineer. I am a citizen. Um, so it's important to all of us. With that said, you know, we all want to see progress. And, and these are the things that can help. And it's the things that can also hinder progress. And, and, and we've got to take all of that into account. Um, what we're doing, and, and based off of the conversation last week, we're not laying in concrete things that cannot change and things that cannot adapt. This is a zoning ordinance that, that is adaptable in the future. We heard that last week. Um, I, I think the staff has, has put in years of work on this. Um, it's, again, the, the flexibility in my mind is there for us to be able to look at any number of master plans that come up between now and the next period of time, whatever that is, whether it be populous or whether it be any other developer, and we can take that master plan and put it against this zoning and say yes or no based off of each one of these areas. So I, I just want to make sure that, that I'm tracking that right, and because I think that's an important dynamic. That what we're voting on today is not the master plan. It is not a set of building. It is not a set of, you know, proposals that have been presented. It is only the zoning parameters that were laid out to us last week. I would <clears throat> agree with everything you say, but one, and I think we do need to approve or vote on a master plan before the zoning. We need to have two motions if y'all are ready to go forward today. Um, the wording of the ordinance requires a master plan to be approved and then the transept districts assigned to that master plan. Uh, what you have on the screen here in, in this is one of the two populist plans that was shown previously. Uh, one, the other one had the expo hall remaining if i remember correctly and didn't have the hotel uh, but this one keeps the theater uh, has a hotel there south of the theater keeps the arena 
uh, and shows the residential along Lawrence Street. Uh, but you're right, Councilman, that this is just a framework. It's not set in concrete, and uh, it can be adjusted in the future by the City Council. But I, I think y'all need to approve this plan as a master plan first and then vote uh, on the zoning. Go ahead. Shay Shayla, what what is the height restriction on CC five currently? Five and what's those? Five stories. Five. For CC five. Yes, sir. It's kind of hard to tell with CC five in the drawing. It looks like such a skinny piece of land where there's going to be one structure. It's actually a fairly deep piece of land where potentially, just to talk through it, there could be two to three story buildings fronting Lawrence Street and then a tiered building behind um, that doesn't face Lawrence Street that could be five stories. There's enough room, enough depth there for multiple buildings. Is that, is that fair? I would agree that that could occur, you know, with the right design professional, yes. And also in four allows for residential as well. So if you go to the south, due south of the Civic Center, which is not part of CC5, which is CC4, is also, according to this, zoned for multifamily. I mean, there's different options with that. But here's, I have a lot of opinions about this and I think I want to thank everybody that's dug in on this um, and I think I kind of said it last week at our meeting that I do think we have to keep what we're doing in context completely agree with what Doug said the code requires us before we make any amendments to also have a master plan now there's some issues there this, the municipal code does not define master plan we heard some comments that what we've proposed is like a PUD. This is also not a PUD. And so this is a unique opportunity for us to move the ball forward on a great piece of property that can benefit the city. Um, and I think that's where there's been a little bit of confusion is because we're in a new territory where we're defining a special district and working within the parameters of the code, which we're doing, but also being sensitive to the budgeting issues that are going to be part of redoing this property, whether that's tearing the Civic Center down or whether it's renovating, that is a massive financial burden. Um, and so, I mean, I've spent a good bit of time digging into this from the legal standpoint and Although the municipal code doesn't define what a master plan is, and it's used in the context of more global planning for the city, not just one city block, it does give us some guidance on what we need in a master plan. It defines it as the general location of public buildings, general location of public utilities and terminals. It mentions streets. And so we're doing these things together but at the same time, we have to be sensitive and keep our mind on the zoning piece and the planning piece. And I think if we vote on a master plan, we have to understand what happens after that. And if we restrict these master plans too much, it's going to restrict our ability and our options to move forward from a financial situation. And so I think there's a lot of balance, and I think the you know, committee has been sensitive to that. I do think the community, I think it's been very thoughtful, everything y'all brought to the church treaties, uh, you know, Brenda and the Government Street Collaborative. I, I, I think this has been a healthy process. Um, I mean, I'd like to get, I mean, some of these things, it's the same issues that keep coming up, I think, from the community, looking at... 65. I mean, parking has been one of the main ones, and I've kind of some questions. I think we need to clarify some of this for everybody. But 
you know, the parking it was mentioned last week, I think Taylor had a great point that this proposal, what we have does require parking. And I, I did have a few questions for y'all on, on the parking piece. Um, in that section, I mean, it mentions, and this came up earlier, on just on the residential, so focusing on CC5, it's one space per unit. And I'm looking at page 16 of the proposal, going off the, <laughs> going off the existing zoning code, not the <laughs> UDC. But it mentions one space per residential unit. Um, if you go down to section six, it, it reads that in this area, SDCC, parking may be shared among the uses within the district. Minimum amount of parking provided within the district must meet the minimum parking requirements for the single use with the highest number of required parking spaces. And I think this is something we should talk through because we talk about, you know, that if there's residential, we've got the parking deck that's been talked about a lot. Are we saying that a residential unit up in that northwest corner is going to be counting parking spaces in the parking deck 300 yards away? That's a little, I mean, I'm genuinely asking. I, I do not know the answer to that. The way it is written is to allow that to occur, yes, so that a parking can be provided in a shared fashion rather than necessarily having it assigned on the same piece of property as the residence. So shared parking would be allowed like that. And I think that's, you know, part of our planning role is to consider these things. Um, I've lived downtown. I've lived in a multi-unit development. We, we had assigned parking, but if I didn't, I probably wouldn't be parking 300 yards away in a parking deck, um, I'd be found in trying to find somewhere closer to park if I'm living in that northwest corner. Um, you know, that gets to the the density. We've talked, you know, we've heard people talk about we need high heights. I know the neighborhood wants lower, obviously. So, my personal opinion on this is making CC5 single family homes is not the best use for that property. Um, it, this is a great piece of public lands that we need to use in the best way possible. I know they wouldn't want some high rise multifamily development and I don't think anyone would approve that. But I think when you look at this, the difference between we've got three options essentially it's single family homes two family dwellings and multifamily the difference is either two or three families onto infinity i think we can put and there's different ways to do this but some limitations that finds a middle ground i know people from the neighborhood have mentioned townhomes um you know five stories to me seems high. i think three seems like a very reasonable uh compromise on that i mean i envision similar to place we used to live that was three stories parking underneath above two stories of residential. Um, that would be something I would be in favor of. Um, and that's just and it, kind of coming at that from a parking standpoint, but also the height, which are, have been feels like two of the main issues that have come up from the neighborhood just in the CC5 area. Um, I've said a lot. I have a lot more I could say, but I want to hear from other folks as well. I agree with the parking concerns that uh, they referenced, um, especially specifically, I think the shared parking deck for the other uses in the zoning outside of the residential CC5 makes sense. Uh, I think CC5 should probably stand alone on its parking requirement being um, separate from the parking deck. I mean, if it could be found somewhere else that isn't necessarily at the unit, a shared parking, I think, is acceptable, but I, I would think it would need to be outside of the parking deck, would, deck, which at time, nighttime specifically for a big event, will be maxed out. Um, I mean, just from an operational standpoint, if you have people living on the site, I could see that as, a, as an issue. But I do agree that one spot per unit is, is sufficient. Um, right now, 
again, we've talked about this, downtown there's not any parking requirement for multifamily or any sort of residential at all. So in a downtown walkable area, you know, one I think would be a, a big increase, uh, but I do agree that it needs to be part of that zoning block or classification. Speak to the height, um, I think some increase from what's on Church Street East in the single family, you know, should be acceptable up to three stories potentially uh, to get that kind of row house look down South Lawrence as you work yourself up to the, um, the massive existing civic center. And I'd like to see more height allowed behind that Lawrence Street frontage. I think it is important to be close in proximity of heights on South Lawrence Street to kind of, um, as Ms. Cochran put, put it with form based code, kind of frame the public realm there in something that's not so off putting. Because um, it is something in form based code that you don't think about a lot, but most of it is based on how the public area is going to be and not so much how the private building is for itself, but how it shapes the public realm. So I think we're close on, on the idea for height there, uh, but with options to, as it's not on a street frontage, get increased height and density off of South Lawrence. I'm not sure the proper ways to do that. Um, again, that would kind of fall on the, on the developer to a degree, and I think staff's idea with five stories was to, you know, that maybe someone would build a lower height on South Lawrence and step up as they go back. Um, so those are my comments for CC5. Um, my other questions are for staff procedurally. Um, I think Ms. Cochran again said uh, we should tell the city council we can't vote on it. Um, what does the process look like going forward in some people in the audience you know, need to understand we are making a recommendation to city council for this zoning and master plan and city council actually has the um, teeth to actually vote on it we're making a recommendation to them to not vote is that is that even an option I mean is our recommend our recommendation simply to make changes and recommend approval or recommend denial or is there a third option to not vote well, first let me say on the master plan, uh, it was mentioned by one of the speakers that we should wait for the city council to approve the master plan and then we approve it. Uh, that's not a requirement in the code. It has to be approved by both y'all and the city council. So I think in certainly the way the, my interpretation of the ordinance is that to, the, to do this into separate districts, we have to have a master plan first. Um, so we would approve the master plan. It would be sent to the council with our recommendation on the zoning uh, and it's up to the council to approve it or change it however they want. And I'm, I'm sure they will. Um, as far as your options, uh, you can approve this master plan. Like I said earlier, I, we need two motions, one on the master plan and then if we approve the master plan, uh, than the zoning. Uh, we're not going to have a master plan that's set in concrete until we have a private developer ready, willing, and able to spend the money to build. So this is just framework. It's, it's a goal to work for the best we can do, um, showing the residential and in, in, in the uh, public space. Um, so you can, if you approve the uh, master plan, then you can vote on the zoning. Uh, you can, if you Turn the mat if you vote no on the master plan, then I don't think I'm not sure we can vote on the zoning. So to confirm we, it, we have to approve a master plan in conjunction with the zoning. Sure. So if we approve what we're calling the master plan and make a recommendation on the zoning, the city council only takes up the zoning, the master plan. No, is they, they have to approve a master plan as well. Okay, so they, in, in, we have to approve that in tandem, or we can deny it, they can approve it, and it's approved. That's what I'm kind of asking. Deny what, the master plan or the zoning? If we don't move forward in the master plan, we, we will. We would eventually have to approve one. If, if y'all... Like I said earlier, there's the, the ordinance doesn't require 
either the council or the planning commission to vote first on a master plan. If you want to deny or vote no on this master plan and recommend approval on the zoning and then let the, the, the city council approve it, you know, I guess that's an option, but I would, I would prefer uh, you approve a master plan before the zoning. I think what makes this unique is that, you know, if this were a private development, there wouldn't be that final, that final third step of a city council approving some future project that would come forward. So, you know, in my opinion, what we have before us is a master plan. It's a, it, while, while being a high level master plan, it's, it's a master plan. And when coupled with the zoning, it does allow the city to move forward and, and, and hopefully have developers come and refine that and then, and, and tighten it up down to the, uh, you know, to the specifics of the zoning and to the specifics of what, you know, any other thing that might, how the building would look if we get down into that level. Uh, you know, I, I think you can't separate the two. The two go, to me, the two go hand in hand. Uh, I, mean, I, I kind of think when doing nothing is, is probably the worst option of, of all because they're just going to sit here and turn and having, being aware of the staff and what's involved in it. I mean, a lot of effort, as the mayor said, has been to get to this point, taking everybody's different perspective in and trying to trying to do something that allows something more detailed to come forward and just knowing that, you know, whatever action happens here with this group, there's still a whole nother level of action that's got to happen with the city administration and the city council. Uh, so, I mean, it gets, it gets scrutinized even harder than a private development would, is I guess kind of the, the point I'm trying to make. Thank you. Here, here's my concern the planning commission passes this master plan. This master plan is the one that's got to go to the city council. Here's my question. What if a developer comes in in two weeks or three weeks, whatever, and has a master plan that is, doesn't have the civic center and it's just got three high rise buildings and they want to take that out. Then what do we have to come back to the planning commission and revise the master plan? Uh, no, sir. Um, in my opinion, that once we approve a master plan and the zoning, unless somebody wants to come back and change the zoning for a future development, that's all we have to do. We're not going to change or have to adopt a master plan every time somebody wants to make a change um, because we know that when a, when a developer wants to do something, as long as his use fits within the district that uh, we designate, then he's good to go. So what does that process look like? Just so I'm, I'm very clear, Let, let's say another developer comes in with a completely different master plan than Populous, and, and everybody loves this plan and they want to go forward with that. What happens? What is that process? If like? the if the zoning's not going to change and add anything y'all want to, if I miss something, uh, it would have to go, the council would have to vote on the sale or lease of that land on that project. But as far as this body's concerned, if it's not changing the zoning, um, I'm not sure we would have any, any more uh, authority uh, on that. Correct. For example, CC1 has a 13-story maximum building height. In the hypothetical, somebody came in and wanted to build a 40-story height. That would have to come back here for the zoning to be, to be revised. So that fits the framework of the existing city buildings that are, that are there. Well, that kind of brings up a question for me. That <coughs> Normally, if there was a story limit in a transect, say of five stories, and someone wanted to develop a six-story building, um, we would not rewrite that transect to fit that height. 
we would either upzone it to something that fit the correct zoning, or we would tell that developer they needed a variance for that extra floor. So to bring that to this, again, I'll choose CC5. Say we did three stories and someone, a developer did want to come in with five stories, would the process be to choose a transect that fits that five stories or to rewrite the transect or ask that developer to go get a variance? I'll let y'all answer that. Those would all be three valid options. Um, we have had one developer propose a six-story building on St. Louis Street that was in a district that did not allow buildings that tall. So they did have to go through a process, and the process that they chose was through the variance process. Just um, curiosity, did they get approved? They did get approved. Now, there are some parameters in the, in the code that talk about when you can upzone to a different transect district, but it's based on your being proximate to that district with the property you're looking at. So if you have a T5 next to a T3 and you want to bump the T3 up, I believe in the code it states that you need to be abutting it in order to go to that adjacent. But I would have to research that more. But not by right. It's not by right. But, you, but to, to even consider the up zoning, you have to be abutting a there, higher There are criteria in there that talk about something along those lines, yes. I have a question. Uh, after this were to, if this were to be passed and the city council passed it, because the city owns the property, the city council will still have to approve anything that happens on this property, right? Okay, so even if something was by right, because the city owns the property, the city council has to approve it, they're still going to have to, no matter what, approve everything that happens on this right. property. They would have to pass a resolution authorizing the sale or lease of the property so they still control it. Okay. And if the developer answering uh, what the councilman mentioned to somebody, or Kurt mentioned that somebody want to come in with a plan and, and bulldoze the arena, um, the council would have to approve that. And if the council did not want that to happen, they wouldn't sell it to that developer. I have a question for staff as well. So what is the actual height? If, so, I mean, it sounds like three stories is kind of a general consensus that keeps coming up. What is the actual maximum height for a three-story building? Because right now it's five for CC5. You talking in feet what that is? Um, so it depends on if it's a residential building or a commercial building. A three-story residential building, uh, if you develop it to the maximum allowed height in the code, would be 46 feet in height. Uh, the five-story building, if it's residential, would have a maximum height of 74 feet. If it's commercial, it would be 81 feet. Thanks. I see an existing T51. There's a okay. That's to consider three-story height maximum 53 feet, and that's probably to make considerations for a taller first story for the commercial uses. That's correct. I think that kind of that was, this exercise brought me. There's been the comments: Why are we creating this new code section? And there's been a lot of comments from the public about why don't we just use the current transect district? I tried it. I didn't get that far because it's these issues that the community has brought forward. It's parking. It's building height. I mean, right now. You know, I've mentioned that northwest corner because parking would be a concern for me. Across the street is T4. T4 allows multifamily. And so when we talk about, you know, uses that are right there, multifamily has been one of those things. Building heights is one of those things. Rather than to meet the feedback from the community, I think going through this exercise of creating a special district. The zoning codes that are special can meet these needs of the community. Um, to me, that is one of the biggest benefits of, of this 
process is being able to define at this level these planning components. Um, you know, when we look at Charter Street East, there's four or five different transect districts just right there in Church Street East. We're able to tailor this specifically to what we want just in these, I mean, CC5 is not a, a massive piece, and I think that has been my response. I try <laughs> to, to use the, the current transect districts, and it creates problems. Uh, and to me, as I've walked through this process, it's become clear that the, the staff has put in a lot of thought in into this code. But, you know, that's certainly to say there's some tweaks that I think we want to make to it. One other couple things. The ARV, that's been brought up, I think, at every meeting. My read on it is this is in a historic district. It's still going to go before the ARV. Is that correct? That's correct. Is there concern the neighborhood has about that? Is there a reason that? Okay, what was your, because I, I, you mentioned it today. Was there something that you wanted to codify that more? What part of our code does it say? Is it that the is it existing zoning ordinance that any uh, property within the historic district has to go before A or B? That in the, in the existing zoning is it in the DDD? Okay, so it's already in there. It's already codified for us. And, and that was I just didn't know if there was a specific concern y'all had because I my read on it was that it was there. I just want to make sure there wasn't something I was. I will tell you, we just had this issue brought before the city council, and I will tell you, the ARB doesn't see them as guidelines. They, they see them as mandates, and, and that was very clear uh, just uh, a week or so ago. So, and, and we are going to look at, at that. Um, but I, I think it's an important aspect that I think needs to remain so we don't come back to end it up with something like this. Um, so, and I think we're all cognizant of, of that, and, and I think that's the path that we would all go down to be very leery of <laughs> whatever is going to be there. It needs to be in, in keeping with, with Mobile. And, and I think that's everybody's concern. So, yeah. Well, for the commission, I just want to point out the existing uh, downtown development district regulations does on page 7 of 49, which is an item number 7, work in historic districts. It states that all properties located within the downtown development district and within a historic district do have to go through the certificate of appropriateness process. Now, what was done in these proposed amendments was to add additional clarification that when we were expanding or proposing an expansion to the building materials list, for example, to make it clear that even though this may be an expanded list, if you're in a historic district, you have to go through that process just to make it crystal clear. Any further comments? Commissioners, the way I see it as it stands before us, we need to, or this chair needs to entertain a motion for.
Special District Civic Center Master Plan. I'll make that motion. Second. Motion on the floor for a master plan for Special District Civic Center. Properly moved and seconded. Comments from staff. Since the uh, original announcement, Ms. Dennison has uh, I mean, her attendance is now here, so we only have one. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, Ms. Denson is now in attendance, so uh, we'll go with Mr. Kirk Matei as supernumerary. May I ask a question? Um, if we want to make recommendation changes on the building height, that'll be on the next section, right? The zoning? As I understand it, yes. So the motion on the floor that's been properly moved and seconded is the master plan for, mo mo excuse me, Civic Center Special District. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next would be the amendments to section 64-3.1 of the Downtown Development District zoning ordinances and Appendix A of the recently passed Unified Development Code of the Downtown Development District. A few comments on this. I, I said it earlier. I, I would like to see CC5. I'd make a motion to limit that at three stories. Uh, but like comments on that. And the other thing was this parking. Uh, in that CC5 area, the current version has would allow and this is all subject to the development but could allow the parking requirements to be used and counted against the parking in the parking deck right that's correct I think we could probably take a 11 was it 11.6 Kirk, and, and just add not to include CC5 um, would be the, the change there. Does everybody understand what we're saying? Or you could add a statement that parking for the uh, CC5 district would have to be met on the premises within the CC5 district. Yeah, and that kind of gets to what's the lot, what's the parcel. Right. You know, where are we putting it? Um, so it must be met within the CC5 district. And you could also, uh, if there was an on-street parking concern, you could state that on-street parking cannot be counted towards the parking requirement for CC5. Bert, I'm going to bring that into the layman's terms. Kind of like an apartment building. If you don't have a spot right in front of your door, you're going to have a spot somewhere down the row. Well. Is that what you're referencing what we're within CC5? On CC5, you'll have your unit where you live. You will have a parking space on the property where you live. It may not be right next to your building, but it will be on the property where you live. So it might be down a few spaces, but it'll be on the property. Understood. So at this time, we have discussion on uh, height within CC5, as well as parking within CC5. To piggyback on Kirk's comments of height on CC5, is it is it possible to staff think to limit buildings on, in CC5 to three stories running South Lawrence? And for instance, if a slava was brought kind of through, and there was a building within the, up on the, um, minimum setback on South Lawrence and another building kind of creating that um, angle that was actually fronting a slava going down but still in CC5 could be increased to that five stories. Can we, can we add limiting? Is that the right way to do it to limit 
space buildings running South Lawrence? One option would be to have a height limit of within the first 50 feet of the property facing South Lawrence Street, for example, that the building maximum height would be three stories within the first 50 feet from the property line on South Lawrence Street. Once you set back <coughs> that 50 feet, you could then add potentially an additional two stories maximum. Within the first 50 feet? As an example. This was one of the issues. We moved that line after down this line used to go like that. We moved that line forward to restrict it more. Right, and, and that's shown on the screen behind you right now. This is where the line was originally, yeah. uh, which would have allowed all of this to be very, you know, a residential primarily here. The line was proposed at the previous meeting to be moved this location. So the one that's before you today for consideration would be the, the straight line version. I think Taylor, 50 feet gets us, you're, you're pretty much at the boundary. Don't have the luxury of is the lot size, you know. I don't. I don't measured know. it this morning. <laughs> well, the de the depth of CC five looks to be uh, about the same depth as the houses across the street. Yeah. I mean, if you just you know compare it, it's effectively the same thing. Yeah, I think the range is between one hundred and two hundred feet. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go check that. Between the actual property line and the uh, edge of CC5 and 1 and 4. We do not have a motion on the floor. We have discussion on property height in CC5, parking in CC5. I think to that point, it may be Makes sense just to leave it at one height in CC5. Um, but to add to the parking comment from earlier, um, 11B4 is commentary on parking structures along frontages and um, the screening. And that in this code is pulled out completely. I'd like to make a motion kind of this trailing motion we have to to put that back in um, to allow 11B4 as it currently is written in the DDD and not to make an exception for SDCC. Of course, if the city builds its own parking deck on its own land, doesn't have to um, operate by the code regardless, but I'd just prefer for it not to be an exception. You're referencing line 14 on page 17 of 49? Yes. Okay. The highlighted section there. <clears throat> so, so I guess is the summary of that motion is in the CC5, a maximum of three stories and referencing back 11B4 in the original DD code for parking. I hear that correctly. Well, did you say, did you? Yeah, I think that would be the, the limiting height to three stories and then 11 uh, A6, A6 um, CC5 needs to be removed from that um, allotment and maintain its own parking requirements. 11 B4 uh, remove the exception for SDCC and while we're going on this I'd also like to um, maintain a 10 foot curb cut in CC5 as we're reducing the heights I think the curb cuts need to match closer to those heights and, and the curb cuts that exist in T3 and T4s um, currently. Is 
That's it for me. Okay. Who who's made the motion? Can we take these separately? I don't think a formal motion has been brought to the yeah. floor, ex <laughs> with the exception of pre-discussion of what the motion would be. Okay. Now that everybody's kind of made their notes, I'll entertain a motion. All right. I think we take these separately, just so we're clear. I'll make a motion to restrict the height requirements to three stories in CC5. Second. Motion has been. Motion to approve the new districts, the new zoning districts, as presented, subject to that one. First. That one. Okay. We can go ahead and vote on that. We have a properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, now there's another change you want to make. We're going to do parking in season Correct. five. Which is going to be 11A6. Have that read all other districts except CC5. Second. Have, and, and have the requirement that parking is on, or what was your language there? It's on site. Parking shall be provided on site within the CC5 district. Yeah, second. Properly moved and seconded on parking in CC5. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Yeah, and I don't have the number of where the curb cuts are in the uh, in the zoning. Um, uh, Mr. Ashton, that's on page 18, um, line 3. Let me ask this question with the curb cut issue. As I'm looking at CC5 in relation to CC1, if we kept the arena and if the current master plan went into effect and we need a semi truck to get in there with equipment to the new arena, is that going to be problematic? What well, comes off of yeah. labor? You got it. Well, it depends on how they configure the master plan, right? I mean, if the loading docks are to the rear. The arena. You've got to access off the canal and the flavor. Keep them trucks off of the residential. Keep them, keep, yeah, keep an 18 wheeler yeah. away from Church Street. Oh. Yeah, I think it's important to, to look at the uh, Slava Street extension, which I guess is what we're, that would really be what that is, would of course need to maintain the width of the current Slava Street. We're good. It can come The additional green. curb cuts yeah. that are referenced in the plan is what I'm speaking no, we're, to. We're good. I, I didn't see that diagram. We're, we're good. It'll come in between two, three, and, and four. We're good. Mr. Ashton, you want to put that in a statement? So I guess the motion would be to remove section three, item three, uh, except CC5. Or CC5 uh, would be a maximum of 10 feet. Is that coherent? We could add to that paragraph specifically calling out CC5 and limiting it to 10 feet along South Orange Street. Right, I'll second that. Properly moved and seconded on curb cuts in CC5. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Just for clarification, Mr. Anderson, we have now done three separate in my view, sub motions of the overall amendments. So let's now 
if y'all so desire, to um, have a motion to adopt the proposed amendments as amended today. Yeah, I got one more question on CC3. Oh, I'm sorry, another one, I'm sorry. Yeah, on, on CC3 with the parking garage, what is the height restriction on that at this point? I'm, I'm looking for it. I'm, I just don't know. Ten stories. Ten stories. Hmm. So the, the current plan calls for, I think, a thousand spaces. How many stories is that? Do we know? The stories reflect, well, it depends on the footprint of the parking garage. Yeah. Um, so the the parking garage that's across the street here, owned by Mobile County, that's a five-level parking garage. It's about 60 feet tall. I don't remember how many spaces are in that garage. So based off of the plan that was presented to us with the parking garage, do we know where that fits into this zoning and in, in the, well, the, the height of that parking garage? For the, I think it went up to 1,200 spaces. The design professional told us that the proposed 80 feet would be sufficient for their garage and maybe more than they would need, but that would depend ultimately on the footprint and the design of the garage. Well, 10 stories is the building height limit, but the parking garage limit is defined in feet in the downtown development district. So 80 feet is what's proposed for a parking garage. What is the limiting factor on that 10 stories for the parking garage? Uh, those are not the same. If the, if the building is built on the, you know, as part of the parking garage property, the building itself can be 10 stories. Um, but a parking garage, if it's built freestanding, is limited to 80 feet. The way the downtown code defines height for a building that's habitable, it's done in stories. Um, if it's going to be a parking garage, it's done in feet. So what if somebody built a building with an integrated parking garage? It addresses that as well. It states that the parking garage, I believe, can be no taller than the building to which it is attached. And I'll find that if you give me a moment. So what's driving that? at 80 feet 80 feet is a height that currently exists and is allowed in the t6 subdistrict i believe so where possible we try to use existing subdistricts to set certain standards for development in the civic center site and to mr cameron's question uh, on page 20 line 19 it states that for parking structures attached to a building for at least 50% of their total perimeter or 80% of their perimeter long frontages, the parking structure height may exceed the limit provided um, as long as they do not exceed the eave height of the attached building. So that would technically allow for a taller parking garage um, if you had a building taller than 80 feet. Does that apply to all surrounding areas or just if there wasn't a building to the west of that, but if there was a building to the south, is just the building to the south the one that it's held in connection to? It has to be actually attached. It has to be attached. Yes. Okay. Any other If CC3 needed to be amended for the specifics of a parking garage, that could be accomplished? Uh, if necessary, yes. Mr. Jones, do you want to formalize this? All right, so I'll take it back to you, Doug. What would you, the uh, guidance here is nothing. Um, 
I think we're good on the parking garage discussion. Is and we're now at a is stage. There no, is there no further amendments to the DDD as you have before you then approve the code, the amendments presented as amended today? So moved. The amended downtown development district code as amended today. So, so moved. Properly moved and seconded for the downtown development district section 64-3.1 and appendix A of the UDC. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Everybody take a breath. We'll move on to the next agenda item. And I'd like to thank those still in attendance for their patience, especially those applicants who have business to tend to. Agenda item one, multiple addresses, Cottage Hill Road, 2113 Demetropolis Road, 2104 Garmin's Lane, Cottage Village Shopping Center. Recommended for tentative approval with 15 conditions. The applicant was present. For the, for the subdivision and the PUD, we'll take them separately. Motion to approve subject to staff recommendations. Second. Properly moved and seconded on the subdivision. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion for the subdivision passes. PUD, findings of fact, of which there were five with 17 listed conditions. The applicant was in agreement. Move to approve subject to staff recommendation with findings of fact B and C. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion for the PUD passes. Rezone. Recommended for approval. So moved. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes for recommendation of rezone. Agenda item two, sidewalk waiver application at 4291 Halls Mill Road. Recommended for approval of waiver. So moved. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Group applications. 3725 Airport Boulevard and 817 Downtowner Boulevard, Excel Academy. We need planning approval with findings of fact and 10 conditions listed. The applicant was present and in agreement. Move to approve subject staff recommendation with findings of fact A, B, and C. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. The PUD at Excel Academy recommended for approval with findings of fact of which there were three and nine conditions. Move to approve subject to staff recommendations with findings of fact A, B, and C. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes for the PUD. Agenda item for 3516 and 3526 Halls Mill Road. Do we need to do anything with that Ma's easement? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, we do need to add a condition stating that all easements be reflected on the final plat with a note placed on the plat stating that any improvements within said easement will require the permission of the easement holder. That will be condition listed under the subdivision as well as the PUD? Correct. We'll take them separately. Tentative approval. Applicant was present and in agreement on the subdivision. So, so moved, moved with the addition of the easement stuff that Margaret was talking about. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes for the subdivision. The PUD, there were four findings of fact and 10 listed conditions. We need to add the easement condition. I yeah, move to approve subject to staff recommendation with findings of fact A through D and adding the easement condition. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Rezone recommendation recommended for approval. So moved. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes to recommend zoning approval. Agenda item five. 1705 Dolphin Island Parkway, Fulton Track Subdivision, been recommended for tentative approval. It also had easement discussion. 
I believe the because easements were shown, you already have that recommended condition. It's simply that there are more easements than what were reflected, mm -hmm. and we just need the correct easements reflected on the final plat with the notation. I'll make a motion to approve subject to staff recommendation of acquiring the MAWS easement to be accurately shown and allowing the staff to work with MAWS and the city's urban forester on landscaping requirements. Second. Properly moved and seconded on the subdivision with specific conditions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, the motion passes. Sidewalk waiver. Staff recommended, recommended uh, denial of the waiver. Motion to approve denial. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. Planning approval required. Blue Pines Hideaway Holdings, findings of fact listed three, 17 conditions. Move to approve subject to staff recommendation with findings of fact A, B, and C. Second. Properly moved and seconded. This is the one that needed the clarification on the tree oh, plantings right. to be coordinated with staff. If that amendment could be made to condition number seven, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I, I would make that amendment to my motion. And also, there was something about the front from the, the front of the setback. property line. Yes, and it, we can change. I believe it's condition number three. Marie. Thank you, Marie. And just say a uh, 25 foot front yard setback. And that way, there's no question as to whether right. it's Dolphin Island Parkway or Neshota. I would like to amend my motion to reflect those changes. Second. Uh, did, is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Properly moved and seconded on the amended motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Moving on to the final agenda item, number 6, 6712, Old Dobbin Drive North, the preserve at Milk House Creek subdivision. We had four speak, excuse me, three speakers in opposition, one in writing, and the applicant was present and gave clarification on items regarding wetlands yeah mr chairman yes mr jones uh, before i make a recommendation on this I, I i do want to let everyone know that this this has been a very contentious um, issue with the neighbors um, both the subdivision renovation and and the rezoning with that said um, the the community really the majority, not everyone, the majority of the community is in agreement with what is before you um, with the understanding that traffic engineering is going to continue to work with us moving forward to make sure that we address the concerns of the residents and the citizens. There's a lot of issues that are going on with traffic. We're working on synchronizing things. That is a horrible area for traffic. Um, at Cottage Hill and Hillcrest, it's one of the worst in the city. Um, and where this comes out, at the north side where Cottage Hill is, we're looking at putting a traffic light there, Mr. Shore, that will help with that. But let me be very clear, if we don't do this, all of the traffic for the northern section of the subdivision would go through one small subdivision in Asheville. Um, and that's almost 100 homes. I think it's about 80, 80 to 90 homes, if I remember right, would go through your subdivision. That's just not feasible either. Rezoning gives us the ability to spread that traffic out to about four entrances with Asheville and Carriage Hills. And we'll be working with traffic engineering to make sure that um, that is done as effectively, as efficiently, and as safely as possible with as little disruption to the neighborhood as possible. Change is never invitable. We don't like it, but that's that's where we are. Um, the other part of this, if we don't do this, then I believe you are going to see multifamily homes go into a single family area, and we don't want that either. Um, so when when you peel back the onion on this thing, what's before us, I think, is the best feasible solution. They have every legal right to build on this land. We can't stop it. If we, if we denied this and they went to court. I'm convinced, I've talked to numerous lawyers, we would lose that case. And if we lost that case, we'd, we, we would have our hands tied. 
So uh, my promise to the community is it's not going to be a, a fire and forget missile. We're going to do it the right way. We're going to continue in the discussions with the developer and the community, and, and it will be a partnership uh, as long as we maintain the relationship with traffic engineering that we have and they maintain to work with us. We're going to get the best possible solutions for the minimal impact to your area. With that, um, I, I recommend approval. Um, Take them separately, subdivision yep. first. Recommend approval with uh, staff recommendations. And I don't know if I don't think there's any finding of fact. Second. second. Properly moved and seconded on the subdivision. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion for the subdivision passes on the rezone recommendation recommended for approval. So moved. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion for the rezone recommendation passes. That brings us to other business, of which there's none listed from staff, correct? However, many might not realize that September 1st, in many observances, is Building and Code Staff Appreciation Day. <laughs> Hell yeah. Google it. What a day to do it. So I'd like to thank the staff, Shayla, Virginia, Marie, Margaret, Bert, and even Doug, as well as traffic representing city engineering and fire and public safety. 